Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, guys. Stacy with me. Shalom. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about a little known fact around Purim. Okay. Actually, what the name Purim means, where we get that name from. Mm -hmm. Well, in this video, we're going to be looking at the Hebrew behind the word Purim, bringing out another fact about this holiday or this holy day as far as its celebration and maybe it has something to do with the breastplate or the ephod or the urim and the thummim okay but we're going to find out in this video now when it comes to celebrating purim if you saw our last video you saw us list some of the things that we do during purim well, we're over here at Wikipedia on their website about Purim. We see some of, what does it say? Some of the main things that they do during that holiday. Right. Matter of fact, go ahead and read some of those. Okay. One of the things they do is listening to public reading, usually in the synagogue of the book of Esther in the evening and again the following morning. And we have on our channel, the complete book of Esther, you know, um, I often try to draw people to that book because it is the complete story when you're reading the book of Esther from the King James Version of the Bible. It's kind of mixed up and there's a lot of missing parts mm -hmm. that are found only in the Apocrypha. And so one of the things we can do during uh, Purim is to uh, review that book. Mm -hmm. um, it's only an audio version as far as I'm concerned. We put it together in the audio, but, you know, it is a read along so we can review that book and get the complete story of Esther. Number two is sending food gifts to friends. Now, this comes right out of the scripture that tells us what it is that we're supposed to be doing as far as um, celebrating Purim. That's one of the things that they did. They instituted every year was to send food gifts to one another. The next is giving charity to the poor. So that's along the same lines of mm -hmm. doing stuff. And last, eating a festival meal. And so we covered that in that last video that was talking about what do we do on Purim. But in this one, we're getting more into the details of Purim. For instance, what is the name Pur comes from in the first place? We're looking over here in the book of Esther, chapter 3 and verse 7. If you would, would you go ahead and read that verse? All right. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month, to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. So when you're looking here, this is where to get the word Purim from, from this word pure. Mm -hmm. But you see right here, it says that is the lot. Right. So the word pure is a substitution for the word lot. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're looking over here at the interlinear Bible for Esther 3 and 7, we see the word per there as Strong's number 6332. But then we see the word that it's talking about, which is the word lot which is concordance number 1486. Right. And when we click on that, what it's talking about is the Urim and the Thummim, how they use those to cast the lots. Mm -hmm. So that's actually what Haman was doing back there. Somehow this guy, Haman, which was a Esau type, got his hands on the Urim and the Thummim and was trying to figure out how to destroy Israel hmm. using the Urim and the Thummim. Hmm. The breastplate that the priests wore, this is actually what they were talking about. This is what he was doing when he was casting lots. He was using the ephod. So when we're looking back at Esther, it kind of reads that it is the feast of the ephod or the feast of the breastplate. Mm -hmm. You see where it says down there, even in chapter 9. Would you go ahead and read verse 24? Okay. Because Haman, the son of Hamathatha, the Agite, the enemy of all the Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pur, that is, the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. So again, we see that pure is just another word for a lot. Right. Which is another word for ephod or breastplate. So Purim is the feast of the lots or the feast of the breastplate. 
And of course, the breastplate being made up of the Urim and the Thummim, which are the combination of the stones that we read about in Exodus chapter 28 and chapter 39, those 12 stones mm -hmm. and the light that they produce make up the Urim and the Thummim. So the Urim and the Thummim wasn't, I guess I always thought that they were um, something that you could put in your hands. And so is what you're 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 explaining is that the urim and the thummim was actually the the light from the breastplate that is that what you're saying yeah we wanted to refer to a video i was going to give a link to a video on the end screens of this one where people can look at an in-depth video of what we did on the study of the breastplate and what it is how it what it's made out of how it works um, we did an in-depth study on it. It lasts about an hour, um, but it covers just about everything. And what we find out in that study, in that scriptural study, is that the combination of the light that they produced and the stones themselves are the Urim and the Thummim. Hmm. But that's covered in that video. Is um, You can actually put your hands on the crystals, but the light is actually intangible. It's actually a spiritual communication. Mm -hmm. But like I said, we covered it in that video and I'll give a link to it at the end of this video. It doesn't really go into the stones too much. The individual stones that makes up the breastplate. Right. Um, in my own studies, this is the table that I came up with for the 12 stones that correspond with the 12 names of the 12 tribes of Israel. But these are the same lots that we hear about in Leviticus chapter 16 and Joshua chapter 18. You remember when the guy had stolen the stuff out of Babylon and they was trying to figure out who it was that had stolen the silver and put it in their tent? Yeah, coming out of the book of Joshua, yeah. That's, they use the lots, the same lots they use to figure out who it was that had committed that thievery. Because the breastplate would have been passed down from Aaron unto um, Joshua's unto priest, right? Joshua, yeah, and we find out so it's still in existence. They still have it down during Ahasuerus time. Right. The thing about it, um, there are many people who are making and using breastplates these days. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a lot of books that was written using the Urim and the Thummim. Mm -hmm. People have actually built these things from themselves for themselves and are using the information that they're gaining from the Urim and the Thummim and are actually writing books like the Book of Remembrance. So can we um, trust these? Well, um, trust the information that we're getting from these modern Urim, Urim and Thummim? Well, as a good question because it's although it's using the similar communication pathways that the ancient prophets would have gotten a lot of times the people who are gaining this information don't quite have all of the biblical knowledge and the experience that those prophets had and so whereas they may be gaining some of the knowledge they don't have all of the pieces of the, the, the puzzle. They don't know how the big picture looks so that they end up um, putting pieces in the wrong places and making a few errors. Like, for instance, in the Book of Remembrance, when it starts talking about the calendar, mm -hmm. it gets some things right, but then it gets some things wrong compared to Enoch. So as far as trusting them, um, you really have to have discernment when you're reading these books like the Book of Remembrance, um, the sealed portion mm -hmm. was also written using the Urim and the Thummim. The authors used the Urim and the Thummim in order to write the sealed portion, mm -hmm. which you find a lot of truths, especially in the early part of the book. But, you know, when you start to get in the latter chapters, you start to find a few discrepancies. Right. And that's what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. You're getting a lot of information, but the author would still have to be able to put that information in the right place in order for it to be considered scriptural. One of the, um, I guess it's not a book, but, you know, 
one of the, uh, well, an audio that we've listened to before, and that reminds me uh, of Claire. Yeah. And how, you know, you say some of, you have to, I guess, eat the fish and spit out the bones with with that. Yeah. And that's sort of what you're talking about. Well, the Claire is different. Carol and Claire, because they was during that time period, I believe, when we were getting more direct communication. The time back there with Ro Roges, mm -hmm. um, um, Damiano Aviedo, um, and those who wrote the uh, Third Testament, they lived in a time period before 1950 when a lot of information was coming directly to people. And so Claire and those guys, they lived during that time. But it's the same case. You have the information coming and a person that don't know how to to put it in the, in, in the right order. Right. You, you could imagine if somebody all of a sudden start feeding you chemistry information or physics information sure you could take down the right information and you can write down what you hear but is a chemistry teacher about to read your book and think you an expert in chemistry all of a sudden or are they going to find errors and stuff where you got right. some things wrong right right mm -hmm. they're going to and so that's what you're dealing with you're going to have some truth in there but you're going to have some errors in there so it can't really be considered scriptural but the thing is, you know, the Book of Mormon also falls in this category. Hmm. The uh, Joseph Smith reportedly used a breastplate that he had found in order to write the Book of Mormon. And by it could have definitely been. Um, well, I'm going to believe that it was not the breastplate that Aaron wore, but it definitely could have been the breastplate that someone else had uh, well, manufactured. Could have made it. The book of Exodus tells us in detail how we can make this um, going into great detail, even in the um, Septuagint translation, giving us a better understanding of the stones. Anybody who really wanted to put one together, um, with the time and resources, of course, could actually do so. Now, if they're going to be able to gain this information and be able to write these books based on it, I don't know. I would have to actually see that for myself. I don't I don't know how all that works right. in this time that we're living in. But the point of this video is that Purim is somehow related to this breastplate. This is the feast of the breastplate. Mm -hmm. So is there something we ought to be doing to remember the blur breastplate during this time, during remember the ephod during this time, because that's the namesake of the feast. It's the feast of the ephod, the feast right. of the breastplate. Right. But I don't know. It's a brand new thought. So you guys, if you would, down in the comment section, you let me know what you think about uh, this feast of lots. Uh, does it have anything to do with the breastplate? Or should that be part of the Purim discussion? Okay, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. Where does the um, two rocks or two uh, two pieces of something come from that we now use as lots? This right here. This right here came from the Jewish community where they had this to be the Urim or the Thummim. I'm sorry, I don't have the text in front of me to see which one is which. Mm -hmm. One of them, I believe it's the Thummim that is the crystals themselves and the Urim is the light that they produce or I may have it mixed up, but the scripture doesn't give you that information. You don't get that information until you get to the keys of Enoch. So people filled in the blanks trying to get an understanding of what the Urim and the Thummim was. And what they came up with was these two rocks, one being a Urim and the other one being the Thummim. But that's not accurate at all. They so, even tried to write that on the rock themselves, but it's not right. Okay, so I have another question, and this just popped in my head. Uh, being related to the book of Jonah, uh -huh. when they cast lots as to, you know, who was... Um, Causing all of the trouble. Yeah, causing all of the trouble, and the lot landed on Jonah. Mm -hmm. What would would what? How would that have worked? Well, it, from that information that we have, it would have been another ephod. They would have had an ephod. Mm -hmm. um, they could have, 
You know, it, it, the priests could have had their own. Um, you got to remember where it started mm -hmm. back there with Melchizedek giving Abraham a sack of crystals. Mm -hmm. You know, they only really made it into a breastplate and all during the time of Moses. But that only proves that it was unnecessary to have such a elaborate uh, combination of, you know, gold and stones and stuff when Abraham just had a sack of crystals. Right. So these guys could have had something similar to what Abraham had, or maybe they had a priest on board, but it would have been something along those same lines. As far as we, the information we're given, we're not given that they were able to change the lot. So come up with some other idea. I think that's very, that's very interesting. And another thing that it speaks of is how we, when we don't have an understanding of the scripture, we take it and make it um, out of something that's not necessarily true. Yeah. You see back here in the keys that he not, it was uh, in key 316, verse 38, he was talking about, on the other hand, the thummim or the energy changes around the Urim crystals. So you have the Urim crystals. The Urim are the crystals. The Thummim is the energy that's created by the crystals. Yeah, sort of like the light. That's the yeah. light, yeah. And uh, with knowledge, it's a whole lot that go with it. That there's a lot to do with this Urim and this Thummim. Mm -hmm. It's just that the Urim part is what we can see, and then the Thummim part would come later. We would be a part of it. So y'all tell us what you think in the comment section. Is pure on the holiday when we will one day all show off our ephods? Well, in the meantime, y'all check out this book of Esther complete with the Apocrypha. This is the audio book that includes all of the missing parts and in order. And check out these other videos and playlists on the Urim and the Thummim.